is advised. <laughs> Schizophrenia, a long-term mental disorder of a type involving a breakdown in the relationship between thought, emotion, and behavior, leading to faulty perception, inappropriate actions and feelings, withdrawal from reality, and personal relationships into fantasy and delusion. At the age of five, Audie Sanchez heard voices. They were mainly good, telling her everything was fine, but sometimes she heard bad voices. One of the voices named Lucy was horrible to her, telling her to cannibalize herself and eat her hand. Lucy and the other voices went untreated. But no one noticed. Friends and family describe Audie as the most level-headed kid around in the family. The good voices that weighed the bad. Audie Sanchez did well in school. She graduated in San Antonio, Texas with a decent average and pursued a career as a pharmacy technician. It was during these studies in 2003 that she met and fell in love with schizophrenic Scott Bushholz. The two began a dysfunctional on-again, off-again relationship. As years went on, life became harder and Sanchez's mental health worsened. She used drugs for the first time in 2006 which only made Lucy and the other bad voices more powerful. With the voices now louder, Sanchez began to display erratic behavior. This caused her to lose her pharmacy job. With her career tarnished, she bounced around from job to job, usually working in fast food restaurants trying to make ends meet. After having a better day than usual, Sanchez visited Austin, Texas in May 2008 with a friend. While her friend received acupuncture treatment, Sanchez wandered off to a CVS pharmacy, where she spent seven hours browsing shelves. Staff became concerned and called the police, where she was taken to the Austin State Hospital. For 16 days, Sanchez underwent various tests and was diagnosed with schizophrenia during this time. It was the first time her family learned of the severity of her mental illness. After her mental state stabilized, Sanchez was released. The nurses at Austin State Hospital referred her to the outpatient care at the Center for Healthcare Services in San Antonio. They gave Sanchez the contact information, set up an appointment for her, and later called to make sure she showed up. Audie Sanchez was paranoid, mildly delusional, depressed, and psychotic with hallucinations. Throughout the summer of 2008, Sanchez was uninsured at the time. She received free outpatient treatment from the San Antonio Clinic, including regular counseling sessions and antipsychotic medication. She was soon feeling much better. By early September 2008, all that changed. The Center for Health Services, with its budget strap, could no longer afford to provide Sanchez's treatment. She would have to either pay or qualify for a government benefit. The paperwork to apply for the government benefits overwhelmed her, especially with Lucy in her head, and she stopped going to the hospital and taking her medication. Around this time, she began another relationship with Scott. A few weeks later, she became pregnant. Her pregnancy followed through without incident, and at one point, Sanchez went to a counselor for depression. After Scotty Bouchol Sanchez was born on June 30, 2009, an infection complicated Sanchez's recovery from giving birth, and she was required to use a catheter for about a week. That setback darkened her mood, and she was soon diagnosed with postpartum depression. Sanchez's OBGYN prescribed antipsychotic medication, but Sanchez complained that it made her too tired. Approximately 17 days later, she stopped taking the medication. Her doctor planned to prescribe an alternative, but before help could be received, Sanchez got into a fight with Scott and moved out of his house. On July 20, 2009, she and the infant moved in with her mother and sister. That same afternoon, she visited a familiar clinic complaining of paranoia and stress. The counselor, Luinda Combs, could tell right away that Sanchez wasn't well. Sanchez spoke of delusional paranoid thoughts that other women were trying to breastfeed her baby. She was hearing voices that informed her that others would like to take her baby away and had visual images of other children's faces transposed on her baby's face. Combs suspected right away that Sanchez had postpartum psychosis. She knew Sanchez had a history of depression and had been institutionalized a year earlier with paranoid schizophrenia. New mothers with severe mental illness are much more likely to suffer from postpartum psychosis. Most alarming of all, Sanchez had stopped taking her antipsychotic medication because of the side effects. Combs told Sanchez she needed immediate psychiatric evaluation and called an ambulance to rush her to the hospital. The counselor wanted to make sure Sanchez wasn't mindlessly shuffled through a busy emergency room, so she called ahead to let the Metropolitan Methodist Hospital Psychiatric Unit know that Sanchez would soon arrive with a likely diagnosis of postpartum psychosis. The hospital worker who answered did not want to take information over the phone, so she also gave the specific details of the client's delusional and hallucinations to EMS workers to pass along to the hospital personnel. The ambulance arrived at Metropolitan Methodist, a private hospital, at 11.39 a.m. 
Sanchez waited 20 minutes and was examined in the emergency room at 12.05. Though Sanchez had been rushed to the hospital because of a mental health crisis, for the next three hours, nurses gave her only physical tests and lab work and determined that her body was mostly healthy. A little before 3 p.m., more than three hours after her arrival, Sanchez was finally examined by a member of the hospital's psychiatric team. Not a psychiatrist, but a trained counselor. During the 44-minute evaluation, Sanchez told the counselor what she had told Linda Combs. The counselor made notes of Sanchez's visual hallucinations and audible voices. The counselor did not have any suspicions of postpartum psychosis. Sanchez then requested to be admitted to the hospital, seeing as her 16-day stay at the Austin hospital had worked prior. Instead, the hospital employed another standard for admission to its psych unit. It boiled down to one simple question. Did Sanchez feel suicidal or homicidal? New mothers will rarely answer this question honestly. Many will never admit to suicidal or infanticidal thoughts because, in addition to the societal stigma of saying they might harm their baby, they fear that, if they answer honestly, the government will try to take their child away. Sanchez was already having paranoid hallucinations about strangers lusting after her son. But whatever she was thinking, Sanchez told the hospital counselor that she was not suicidal, not homicidal, and she had no command hallucinations. Command hallucinations are voices that instruct a person to take specific actions. The counselor checked the note box on a form next to the line that read, is the patient having suicidal or homicidal ideation or making threats? Sanchez was given a flyer on dealing with anxiety with the name of a clinic she could contact, though it had no address or contact information on it. And that was that. Over the next few days, the voices worsened, telling her that the devil was in her son, and Sanchez would avoid looking into her infant's eyes for fear of seeing the devil. The power of Christ compels you! Five days after being released from the hospital, Sanchez went to Scott's home demanding her infant's diaper bag with the baby in her arms. At some point during their exchange, she became agitated when he told her he needed a copy of the baby's birth certificate and social security card. Sanchez's behavior shifted at this. Scott's mother Kathleen noted Sanchez's erratic behavior and urged the new mother to seek help. Paranoid that Kathleen wanted to steal her baby and breastfeed him, she ran from the house. Sanchez threw the car seat into the front passenger seat and sped away without safely buckling the baby. She left so fast she left behind the diaper bag she came for, her purse, and her medication. They called the Bexar County Sheriff's Department and reported concerns over Sanchez and the infant. The incident was treated as a disturbance, but police took little to no action. In the early morning hours of July 26, 2009, the voices in Naughty's head were too much to handle. She was going crazy. She woke up her sister Priscilla Garcia and gave her baby Scotty. And when she calmed down, Priscilla gave her baby back. Around 4.30 a.m. while the rest of the family slept, Audie listened to Lucy and attacked her infant son with a large kitchen knife and sword. She mutilated his genitals, his head was nearly decapitated, she had flayed his skin, cut off his ears, she chewed three of his toes off and cut off some of his fingers, she ripped off most of his face, she ate parts of his brain and internal organs, and bit baby Scotty across his body. Priscilla Garcia was awoken to screams at 5 in the morning. I didn't mean to do it, he told me to. She woke up to a scene of horror in her bedroom doused in blood. Priscilla dialed 911. During the 911 call, the operator could hear Audie Sanchez screaming, I love him, and that she stabbed herself in the heart and stomach. At one point during the frantic call, Priscilla Garcia tried reassuring her sister that she was still alive. Audie, this time I told you to come to me. I tried, but you told me that you had died. I'm not dead, Audie. I'm standing right here talking to you. Audie Sanchez was sitting on the couch bleeding from her self-inflicted wounds to her chest and throat screaming, I killed my baby, I killed my baby. She told officers the devil made her do it. Audie Sanchez was hospitalized for her self-inflicted wounds and later charged with capital murder and held on a $1 million bond. Audie Sanchez was evaluated by three separate psychologists at the North Texas State Hospital Verin facility, including Dr. Randall Sellers and Dr. Lucy Puryear, to determine her competency to stand trial. Dr. Puryear wrote, It is my medical opinion that Miss Audie Sanchez was incapable of telling the difference between reality and her delusions. Dr. Sellers concurred, saying it was my opinion based upon reasonable medical evidence that Ms. Sanchez had a severe mental illness, paranoid schizophrenia, at the time of the alleged crime. According to their notes, Sanchez said that she had heard voices telling her that her mother killed John F. Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe, and for her mother's role in the killing of the president, the KKK was mad at her. The voices also told her to hurt Scotty, that he was going to be the apocalypse. The voices told me to eat his insides. I was a harlot because I had committed adultery. There was a demon in my stomach and it would only come out if I ate Scotty. This had to be done by 5 in the morning. After that, Scotty would evolve and would no longer be possessed. She explained how she killed her son and how she gagged and threw up while eating his flesh and brain matter, but the voices forced her to continue. Even after her arrest and hospitalization, Sancho said she continued to hear the voices. They told her that she was going to get a heart transplant and that she was going to be hurt. 
On June 30, 2010, Audie Sanchez was found not guilty by reasons of insanity and is currently in a mental health facility where she will remain for, if not all her life. Despite the evidence that Sanchez was insane at the time of the killing, some in San Antonio openly called for the death penalty. They included Scott Bushalls who said, I think she should be punished to the fullest extent of the law. She killed my son, she should burn in hell. Scott went on to say that she was a sweet person and he still loved her but she needs to pay the ultimate price for what she has done. I'm glad my daughter is getting a second chance at life, Manuela Sanchez said. I'm sorry my grandson didn't get that chance. <laughs> Mr. Scary.